Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. We have come to episode 42 of the show, and rather than discussing the meaning of life, we are covering Nintendo Power number 30 for November of 1991. After much deliberation, I decided to start doing full reviews of the games in the SNES Spotlight. This will make for longer episodes, but that will hopefully mean that each of the two parts will be closer to 10 to 15 minutes. So, we've got a lot of ground to cover this time. Let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Final Fantasy II. The cover has a character from the game, I'm assuming it's Edgar the Bard, flying towards a castle on a black chocobo. This time in the letters column, we have letters from readers saying what celebrities they'd like to play Game Boy games with. Probably my favorite of all of these is the writer who wants to play Tetris with former Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev. It's actually a novel concept as far as playing a game with a head of state, in particular a game which their country has become famous for putting out. I'm not sure who I'd pick to play with, but I know that the game would probably be either Tetris or Radar Mission. Anywho, our first game of the issue is The Flintstones, a platformer based on the Hanna-Barbera animated sitcom, and the guide gives maps of the first overworld map and some early stages. If I was to explain the problems with this game in one word, it's that it's slippery. I don't mean that in a figurative sense, that the game's mechanics are hard to grasp, but it keeps changing things up on you. No, it's that the game's physics are literally slippery. Like, every level in the game is an ice level. Fred Flintstone, when he stops receiving controller input after he started him moving, moved about a full body width, or sprite width, before stopping. That's not if the player is pressing the run button before um, when he's moving. It's just by default, normal move animation. Mario doesn't take that long to stop moving. Mega Man doesn't take that long to stop moving. Simon Belmont doesn't take that long to stop moving. Now I realize this is a game based on a cartoon, and if you watch the Flintstones cartoon, when Fred moves, or for that matter, other Hanna-Barbera characters like George Jetson or Yogi Bear or the Scooby Gang, if they stop moving from a run, they tend to skin to a, skid to a stop in a sort of uncontrolled fashion, unless they're doing just a general walk. However, that skidding and the almost uncontrolled motion that comes with it is something that's done for comedic effect, and it works when you're doing slapstick cartoons. When you are designing a video game, especially a platformer, the requirements are different. It's a case where you have to take some elements of look and feel of the work in question and put them aside for the sake of gameplay, for the sake of playability, and how, and how fun the game is to play. How well it controls. So, when you, metaphorical you, are designing the run animation and run physics for that character, the question you should be asking yourself is, do you take the physics and inertia from the character in the original work and design the level around those animations, by making levels where there's no need for precise jumps, where you can have the skidding and not worry too much about it? Or do you dump that aspect in, in favor of making the animations fit the levels, by dumping your uncontrolled run, or your skid, or, or the skid, or that sort of thing, from the work, and just having a more tight, precise jump to fit to the tight, precise level design? The developers of the Flintstones chose to do neither, to keep the animation from the show while designing the world for more precise controls, and it simply doesn't work. I almost wonder if this game began its life as something else, and then the developers got the Flintstones license. In Nestor's Adventures for this issue, Nestor is playing go-karts as a proxy for F-Zero, and the tip for this game being that sometimes you gotta ram a foo. It's a certainly more useful tip from last time. Though, you know, the Howard and Nestor strips always have the two basically going from
from game world to game world in some form or another. These intrusions of the we of the real world, by contrast, seem forced. I'd kind of rather that we just had Nestor in the game worlds, rather than having these Calvin and Hobbes or Walter Mitty style fantasy sequences. In the classified information column, we have more tips for Super Mario World, showing how to get more 1-ups, and a revised version of the Konami code for Gradius 3 on the Super Nintendo. Speaking of the Super Nintendo, we now come to our cover game, Final Fantasy 2. Now, unlike the Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest guides, we don't get detailed maps or recommended levels for particular parts of the story or item stats for um, shops, but we do get story guidance. Now, before Final Fantasy VII came out for the PlayStation 1 and introduced a generation of gamers to Japanese RPGs, Final Fantasy II, or Final Fantasy IV, as it was originally titled and which I'll be calling it for basically the rest of the episode, did the same thing for gamers in the 16-bit console generation. There are very, very good reasons why this game is so well regarded. In short, Final Fantasy IV takes the basic concept of the first Final Fantasy, a quest for the Four Crystals, and changes it dramatically by building an incredibly strong, though linearly structured, narrative around the gameplay and the quest for protecting the crystals and recovering them and that sort of thing. The game's plot, it's so well known that I don't particularly have to get into it here, so instead it's worth getting into what this game does differently. In addition to introducing several new jobs, like the Dark Knight the Paladin, the game has a dramatically larger scope compared to earlier titles in the series, one that I'd argue wouldn't really be matched until the release of Final Fantasy VI. In terms of going on the surface of the Earth, underground into the, dwar into the Dwarven Realm, and all the way up to the Moon. However, because this game is such a gateway for such people, it feels less definitive, at least the SNES version does, due to all the re-releases with graphical overhauls and gameplay tweaks. Um, between the, this version, the Game Boy Advance, the PlayStation 1, the DS, and mobile versions, you can find a copy of this game with almost minimal effort, and all of these versions will, in their own ways, be a little better than this one, whether it's having tooltips to remind you what spells do, or better spell naming, because they can do the whole cure, cura, curaga thing, as opposed to cure, cure one, cure two, cure, cure three, um, and having a bestiary with monster information you can look up, and that sort of thing. Or, for that matter, telling you when you look at weapons how they affect the we how the weapons affect your stats. Um, whether they're better than what you've currently got. Still, as far as the game itself is concerned, particularly at this time, this is a solid game that fixes a lot of the gameplay problems from the first Final Fantasy. Um, your characters are not blank slates. They have their own personalities, their own motivations for their actions, starting from the very beginning of the game. Um, and additionally, with this, um, from its raw mechanical standpoint, your characters will retarget enemies when an enemy is killed, so you can safely gang up on an enemy if possible. There are enemies where you have to pay attention to what they're doing and not just blindly attack them. Um, you have the ability to put your characters in block mode, that sort of thing. I also feel like there is less of a focus in grinding in this one. There's certainly still grinding that is done, um, and if you really want to break the game, you can just super grind if you really want to. Um, but it feels like, at least for the early persons of the game, maybe a little more later, you don't have to grind as much as you would in, say, the original Final Fantasy or in the Dragon Quest games to get ahead in the game. Um, that said, the game is a, has a very slow start. You don't get to actually control your characters until about 10 minutes in, to really control the characters, and you don't actually get to buy weapons and armor until the 30 minute mark. Additionally, the rapidly cycling party members through the game in terms of having characters die or f fake die, or be presumed to die, and getting having new members popping in, can cause problems where when you find a party lineup that you really like and then have to dump the characters that you were accustomed to and enjoyed having in your party. Further, the fake-out deaths for party members later on 
gets frustrating and undermines any gravitas that many of those scenes thus have. It does heighten it whenever one of these deaths is real, but otherwise it, it feels kind of less when you're on the second character who was presumed dead and then has suddenly come back. In Counselor's Corner, we get advice on getting across the first of the Butter Bridge levels in Super Mario World, along with advice on beating Si Ma Yi in Destiny of an, of an Emperor. Next up is our next entertainment game. Um, we haven't had one in a while. Um, where in time is Carmen Sandiego for the Super Nintendo? Uh, we have a guide for the game along with a walkthrough of one case. This is a generally good port of the game, preserving the gameplay and making the interface navigable from the PC version. I mean, complexity-wise, the game is less based around navigating difficult puzzles or having to steer a complicated vehicle and more around making notes of clues you need to solve the case. Additionally... I'd say this game, more than where in the world is Carmen San Diego in terms of the earlier versions, holds up in this current age of smartphones and Google um, in terms of being completable without the book that came with purchase of the game. As you can use the internet to look up answers to clues in terms of, oh, who was prime minister of this country when or when was this person queen of Holland or that sort of thing without having to play a page of the book, as opposed to where in the world of Carmen, is Carmen Sandiego, where, for example, they may be referencing uh, gross, dom gross domestic product information that is no longer valid, or key export information that is no longer valid, due to economic changes and climate changes and political changes. My primary complaint about this game, though is that some of the time limits for cases that you face are just too small to be completed in the time available. I've had situations where I figured out where I need to go next. That part's fairly straightforward, but because I also need to keep asking around to find additional information about my suspect so I can get a warrant when I catch up to them, I end up wasting turns before moving on. It's kind of a nuisance. All right, next up, Activision is a combat flight simulator with ultimate air combat for the NES. Fighter combat games at this time in history are not ready for console prime time. On PCs, you have the myriad number of controller inputs or keyboard inputs on the keyboard itself, plus you have a flight stick. Everything's peachy keen. Here, not so much. Piloting your plane is a royal pain in the butt in terms of general flying, in terms of lining up a shot on enemy aircraft. I think it's safe to say that, honestly, in terms of console flight sims, as much as people say, oh, games were better back in the day than they are now, console flight sims have only gotten better in time. Not only in terms of graphical fidelity, but more importantly, with controls. Next up is, an, is another platformer based on a cartoon with Tom and Jerry, a platformer where you control Jerry and try to rescue his nephew Tuffy from Tom. This is a platformer based around navigating various mazes and platforms. It frankly doesn't control very well, and it also doesn't feel conductive to the spirit of the Tom and Jerry cartoons. Something that felt like Tom and Jerry would be something where you're avoiding traps set by Tom and possibly using those traps or other aspects of the environment against him. This game, you're fighting generic enemies in a sort of house environment. This could be, this is again another one of those games where it could have started its life as something else entirely in as a Japanese platformer, and then you got turned into a Tom and Jerry game for a U.S. release. We'll probably get a big example good example of what we're looking for and what I'm looking for in terms of a good adaptation of a intellectual property or a cartoon to a video game in a Bugs Bunny game on the Super Nintendo a little later. We move on to the Game Boy games with a Game Boy version of Battletoads with only one toad going up against the forces of the Dark Queen. I would consider this game a superior port to the original NES game. 
In particular, the game basically puts some limited continues in the game. And when you continue, you pick up at whatever your last checkpoint was, rather than making you start the level over. This is actually pretty brilliant game design for dealing the difficulty of a game like this. And it's perfect for a portable game. Next up is a Game Boy version of Kid Icarus, subtitled of Myths and Monsters, and we have maps of the first three stages. This game is actually rather impressive. Kid Icarus, as a title, was all about its verticality. The constant climb ever upwards, never turning back as dropping back down meant death. This Game Boy version handles the verticality very well with stages just about as big, maybe a little smaller, than the original games, with the added bit that you can actually go back down. This allows for more exploration and examination of the game than earlier title than the earlier version had, and I do kind of wish the revival of this series on the 3DS had focused more on verticality and exploration than on its Sin and Punishment style gameplay. Next is Faceball 2000, the first first-person shooter we've come across thus far, and also, I believe, the first portable first-person shooter. Faceball is a very basic first-person shooter with some rather ambitious design considering the hardware capability of the Game Boy. It's a game where the level geometry is actually kind of polygonal. The game also has a horizontal free look, sort of like um, Wolfenstein, or Doom, and some fairly free movement between the levels, aside from the fact that the levels themselves and the paths in the levels are fairly narrow. The gameplay is fairly simplistic as you're navigating very basic mazes in search of the exit without necessarily the need to find keys or anything like that. Still, the game's controls are very sluggish, likely due, due to the limitations of the Game Boy hardware. Now this game gets a Super Nintendo port later, and I'm interested to seeing how that compares to this version. Um, as again, this game is fairly close gameplay uh, in terms of gameplay-wise to some of your classic first-person shooters like again Doom and Wolfenstein, with the two main differences of the spaces of the levels themselves are much more confined and restricted, and you don't have a weapon selection really. Continuing with the Game Boy ports of NES games, we have Double Dragon 2. Double Dragon 2 is, in a way, the superior game to the NES title. It gets rid of it changes the plot from the NES and arcade versions with Marion's death, and instead is the dragon's frame for the murder of one of the other teachers at the dojo where they work, and are for and them being forced to clear their name on the streets of a very late 70s, early 80s influenced New York. The game also dumps the platforming that caused problems with earlier games, leaving us with a much more conventional brawler, but one which still handles very well, complete with some special moves related to hitting both buttons followed by the punch buttons. I kind of wish that we just got an attack and a jump button so we could have had dive kicks, but I'm fine with what we got. I consider this to be an underrated gem in the Double Dragon series, and definitely something fans of brawlers should pick up. Wrapping up the Game Boy games, we have Word Zap, or rather Word Zap and Word High, a double puzzle game based around putting together words from letters. These games are the kind of games that I feel are perfect for people who are good at Scrabble or who want to be good at Scrabble. It's a good enough puzzle game, though my Scrabble skills aren't good enough for me to have any particular skill at the game itself. I kind of wish the game had some sort of common names in the dictionary, or for that matter, expanded word list. But otherwise, I'm certain that this game is great. If you're good at Scrabble, you're going to rock at this game. It's not my thing. In the Game Boy Classified Information column, we have a stage select code for the Hunt for Red October. Then we have our... Uh, Game Boy Coming Soon column with notes on an upcoming Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, along with Ninja Gaiden Shadow, Terminator 2, and Hudson Hawk. Moving on to Super Nintendo titles, we have our first SNES tennis game with Super Tennis. This guide gives us a rundown of the playable characters and different, courses, different um, court types and that sort of thing. Play. One of the points that is brought up about the Madden games 
um, this particularly came of note because it came up on a episode of the Video Game Years, is that when John Madden got involved in the game's development, he wanted to make sure that this was a game that would help people who didn't understand football understand football. I bring this up because I don't understand how tennis is scored. This game doesn't help me at all understand that. I think I'm scoring points, but apparently I'm not, and I don't really understand why. Other than that, the controls are fine enough. I do have a problem with the camera perspective when the computer is surfing and at the top of the screen while I'm at the bottom. It chops off most of my side of the court, or at least a significant chunk, which makes it difficult for me to judge where the ball is in relation to me and the rest of the court. Next up is UN Squadron, the US home console port of the arcade game Area 88, based off the anime and manga of the same title. The article gives a rundown of the playable characters and the fighters, which are all real-world fighter planes, and notes on several of the levels. Something I share in common with Shinya Arino of Game Center CX is that I am terrible at shoot 'em ups, but I love them anyway. And I love UN Squadron in particular, as when I dis discovered it, I was getting into anime and manga. I noticed the anime style to it when I first saw the game, and it inspired me to pick it up. At which point, I had lots of fun with it. Uh, in fact, my enjoyment of the game led to me picking up the anime series later. So, when I came to revisit the game for this review, I will say straight up that the game holds up. It is an incredibly strong shooter. The ability to acquire new aircraft and upgrade them, as well as to choose your power-up loadout, is something which we, aside from Gradius 3, haven't really seen on the SNES. But Gradius 3 lets you change your power-up selection, but you didn't have the also ability to switch between multiple different types of fighters. At least not that I recall. We've seen this before in a few titles on the NES as well, but those are um, particularly some shooters from a uh, compile, but not really from the main publishers, not from your Konami, not from your Capcom, um, and not really from uh, Hudson, who has also did, did some shooters, so it's nice seeing something really different like this. Also, it's a game which I'll bear as mentioning. It wears its anime stylings on its sleeve and didn't have them changed for the U.S. release. It didn't have a more anime-style protagonist turned into a more Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone-style protagonist. So, that's also very nice. Wrapping up the Super Nintendo titles, we have Super Baseball Simulator 1000, or 1.000. The first baseball game on the Super Nintendo that has been covered thus far. There are notes on stadium types and special moves in the game. And much to my frustration, I was not able to play this game for review, despite all my efforts to find a way to play it. So I can't capture any gameplay footage for it, or give any actually informed opinions on the game. Crap it. Anyway, in the now playing column... The NES is getting the Space Shuttle Simulator Space Shuttle Project. I've actually played this game before, though not the NES version of it. Uh, my local science museum, OMSI, had the PC version available to play. On the Super Nintendo front, we have more screenshots from Darius Twin and Ultraman. In the Top 30 column, The Little Mermaid and Bill and & Ted's Excellent Video Game Adventure have entered the list. We've got a moderately big name in our celebrity profile again this issue. Uh, we have Robert England, who is best known to the world as Freddy Krueger, is profiled. England is actually still acting, though he's not doing that many starring roles, uh, primarily doing supporting roles in film and television works. Not as much horror, either. Closing out the issue, the Pack Watch column has a look at the upcoming release of Empire Strikes Back for the NES, along with the third Nintendo Wizards and Warriors game. Additionally, the Super Nintendo is getting Lemmings and the and True Golf Classics. Now, as with last time, I'm doing the obvious pick of the issue and a less obvious pick. The obvious pick for this issue is the cover game, Final Fantasy II, or Final Fantasy IV. It's actually probably easier to find the game now as Final Fantasy IV, since Square Enix has released it a bunch themselves on other platforms, and we don't have to worry about keeping it in numbering with the... American NES release. As it is, since the game is available on pretty much every platform, yes, even that one, you can probably go pick up the game right now without any hassle. And I mean, like, 
any hassle. Like you could like be going onto your smartphone right now while you're watching this episode and downloading it right now. My second pick is UN Squadron. It's a game that holds a special place in my heart, and I also honestly consider it one of the best shooters I've covered for the show thus far. If you can find a copy, it's definitely worth picking up. Now before I go, a little bit of business. On November 7th, 2015, I will be live streaming for 24 hours on Twitch, currently the plan is Twitch, as part of this year's Extra Life live stream. I will be raising money for Dornbecker Children's Hospital in Portland, Oregon, with all funds being raised going to Dornbecker. There will be a link in the show notes where you can donate. This whole thing is through the Children's Miracle Network as well, so if you are going to donate, check with your workplace, your HR department, whatever, as some employers do a matching dollar thing, and while donating 10 bucks is great, if you can get your employer to donate an additional 10 bucks, that's even better. It helps more people. So, check the link, donate a few bucks, so that when you're telling people you're doing good, you can not only be factually correct, but also grammatically correct. Yeah, I think that's how that works. Anyway, if you also want to toss a little money my way to help support the show, please check out my show's Patreon page, link also below. For a few bucks a month, you can help support me making shows like this, possibly even help me get me improve the quality of the show, and also get your name in the credits. So, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time. Thank you.